Two police officers fought for their lives this week while trying to subdue a suspect, a suspect who had just punched a pregnant woman in the face. What do you grab? What do you grab? I got my gun. What? And should one Charles Manson devotee, a woman convicted of seven murders, get parole? Apparently, the Los Angeles district attorney doesn't care enough to have his prosecutors contest her release, so she just might go free. What on earth is happening in this week's crime recap? Welcome to Profiling Evil and this week's Crime Recap. If you're new to our channel, thanks for stopping by. And please hit that like and subscribe button. Now, if you're one of our longtime members, thanks for your support. But either way, folks, make sure you're ringing that bell so that you get all of our notifications on videos like this one. This week, I'm coming to you from Washington, D.C. And I want to start by looking at a case where police officers put their lives on the line, trying to arrest an unstable suspect who was wanted for assault. Let's go to Ogden, Utah for this first story. Police responded to an assault charge last week and they found a pregnant woman who had been repeatedly punched in the face by a violent offender. As the officers approached the scene, the suspect took off running and after a short foot pursuit, one officer cornered the suspect and attempted to talk him down. The suspect was irrational, shouting at the officer and failing to comply with the officer's lawful commands. Suddenly, after the officer is clearly heard saying, hey, let's just talk, the man stands up and tells the officer, quote, just shoot me, close quote. Well, watch as the officer repeatedly tells him he isn't going to shoot the man. He only wants to talk to him. The suspect repeats, just shoot me. I want to die. I'm suicidal. Let's watch this video of the case from police body cameras. Turn off for a second. Sit down. Okay, sit down. Well, once the officer's backup arrives, the two officers attempt to handcuff this suspect who's uncooperative and combative. A struggle ensues, and, and I want you to watch this video carefully. I mean, there are so many people out there who are second-guessing police officers. This suspect had allegedly committed an assault on a pregnant woman, repeatedly pummeling her in the face. He evaded police. He refused to cooperate with their lawful investigation. They don't know what they're dealing with other than they have a combative person who wants to be killed. He was refusing to comply with their efforts to arrest him, and now... The suspect and the officers are down on the ground fighting. Shoot me! No, we're not gonna. Yes! No, kill me! I'll kill the fucking stop! Hey, what do you grab? What do you grab? I got my gun. What? Let go of his gun! No, I'm gonna kill myself. Stop! Stop! Let go of his gun! Now here's where things really get frightening in my book, folks. And I tell you, I've been there. I've been in these situations. Every one of these encounters can turn deadly. And this one nearly does as the suspect struggles to get the officer's weapon from his holster. Now think about this. The officers are struggling to just get his hands behind his back and handcuff him so that they can securely talk to him and assess the situation. Instead of complying, he's trying to get their gun, and he's successful. Listen as the officer shouts out to his partner that the suspect in the middle of this fight now has gained access to his weapon. And think for just a moment about what you might do if you were the other officer, knowing that this suspect now has disarmed your backup. Let's watch. We got another unit. Watch that, please. Stop! Get off it! Shots fired, shots fired. Stop! No, I'm gonna kill myself. Here we have the officer yelling, he got my gun, he got my gun. Then, 
gunshots are heard. Well, exhibiting incredible bravery, these officers respond much differently. Now, police say no one was injured when the firearm was discharged, but here's what I'd like you to just hit the pause button and respond to for a moment. My question's simply, what would you do when the suspect got his hands on the police officer's weapon and fired that first shot? Now, if you were the other officer, they're struggling for a weapon. Obviously, he's got enough control to pull the trigger. Would you resort to deadly force and pull your firearm? Or would you try something less lethal, like deploying a taser? Now, pause for a moment and answer the question down below. And I'm going to be reading these. Well, the officer showed incredible restraint and chose to deploy his taser rather than using deadly force on the suspect, who now has some level of control over the officer's weapon. And in my opinion, he had, he had the authority and the right at that point to use deadly force. Now, remember, this suspect was asking police to shoot him. We don't know if he was suicidal. Was it uh, something like that? Would he continue to try to get control of the other officer's weapon and use it against both officers if he got full control? Pay really close attention to how ineffective this taser appears to be, too. Tasers are incredibly valuable tools in the hands of police officers, but sometimes suspects are so ramped up that they're not effective. It might be because they're not conducting well with the body of the, the suspect, or it might be that they just are so ramped up they're not responding. So my question goes back to this ground squell, this second guessing that the public is doing with police officers. Are police officers starting to put their own safety at peril and moving to less lethal force when deadly force is justified simply because they don't trust their government to stand behind them? This is really terrifying to me, and, and while I'm glad that the officer didn't have to resort to deadly force, nor have to deal with the emotional impact of deploying your, your weapon and killing someone, I worry that these peace officers are putting their lives at greater risk. Now watch the final scenes of this video, and then weigh in again down below. I'm going to be reading your answers, and please take time to read each other's comments and respond to those. Let's watch this. Let go! Let go! Kill me! No! Are you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. Yeah, I think. I think I'm good. Stop! Kill me! Stop! Let go! Kill me, please! Let go! Please, kill me! Okay, let go. Let go! I did. I did. We're trying to help you. you kill me. No! Please. Put your hands behind your back, man. Please, just kill me. Jesus. You good, dude? Yeah. 82 on now. Well, police eventually get the suspect handcuffed and they book him into the jail. The police department said that the suspect had an extensive felonious criminal history. Now, once the suspect was examined and released from a local hospital, he got booked into the jail for eight charges, including disarming a police officer of a firearm, assault on a police officer, failure to stop at the command of an officer, and felony discharge of a firearm. Now, let's move down to Southern California and talk about somebody that we haven't talked about much for a while, Maya Miliette. Have you wondered what's been happening in her case? Remember, she's the Chula Vista mother who disappeared in January of 2021. Her husband, he was later arrested and charged with her murder. He sits in a jail cell right now awaiting trial, but his family the husband's family, the suspect's family, is keeping the case in the news. That's right, but it's not like you might expect. They aren't searching for Maya, nor are they demanding police to do more to find the missing woman's body. <laughs> no, instead, they're suing the Chula Vista Police Department for what they characterize as police misconduct, 
for violating their civil rights when those search warrants were served on their home back when they were building their case against her husband. Now, the suit alleges police used excessive force and unlawfully entered the grandchildren's bedroom and detained the family while they were conducting a search. The plaintiffs say that they were embarrassed, humiliated, shocked, and very upset at the police officer's conduct, according to the suit. There was no mention of, we were in the backyard saying to police, please do everything you can to find Maya. Please, our home is your home. Look for anything that you think might help you find Maya. No, they weren't doing that. They complained about police stopping them on the day of Maya's husband's arrest. They they were patted down and their vehicle was searched. And they were told they couldn't return to their home until police finished arresting Miliette and searching their residence. So here's an interesting question to consider. Do you think law enforcement's gone overboard on their efforts to find Maya Miliete? Well, while all this legal maneuvering is going on, the community came together to focus on the real issue, Maya Miliete. You see, on May 1st, Maya would have been celebrating her 41st birthday. She was remembered by friends and family at a gathering at a place called Fiesta Island. Perhaps some of you attended that. And, and so here's a question that I have for you. Did any of you happen to see Larry Miliete's family, the people that are suing police, or her children in attendance at that memorial get-together? Keep in mind that Larry Miliete is scheduled to be in a Chula Vista courtroom for a preliminary hearing later this month, June 27th. Until then... He's going to remain in jail without bail. Now, since we're in California, I want to talk about two big stories in California. There's encouraging news tonight that people like you and me, people who are fed up with prosecutors who are soft on crime and criminals, are are making a difference. Those people are making a difference. This week, San Francisco residents voted overwhelmingly to recall San Francisco District Attorney Boudin, sending a clear and concise message that his efforts to reform the criminal justice system his way, which was in the use of cash bail, stop the prosecution of minors as adult, and and use the coronavirus disease as a reason to get people out of jail early. They said, no, we don't buy it. Think about this. In case you you forgot, Boudin was the first San Francisco DA to ever file homicide charges against city police officers. Before the vote came in, Boudin told his supporters that he was just getting started in his push for criminal justice reform. He stated, quote, We have two cities. We have two systems of justice. We have one for the wealthy and the well-connected and one for everybody else. And that's exactly what he said they were fighting to change. He says, we know exactly what we are fighting to change. We know that this is a system that has systematically failed us, not for decades, but for generations. Well, changing that system led to increases in crime numbers. I mean, there was no discussion of skyrocketing crime numbers in San Francisco, There was no mention of the fear that many San Francisco citizens feel when they walk along their city streets. You know, I wondered how the city can function with feces on the sidewalk, beggars who block the walkways and ask for money, or those mom and pop grocery stores that have empty shelves because of all the thefts that are going uninvestigated. It wasn't many weeks ago that Walgreens closed five stores in San Francisco because of organized retail thefts that were going uninvestigated. Another blow to a city that earned an embarrassing reputation for its widespread and brazen shoplifting. Now, I'm not speaking from what I'm reading online, folks. I walked the streets of San Francisco last week, and I witnessed this for myself. Well, now, Boudin is gone, and the mayor's looking for his replacement. That's how decent, law-abiding citizens demand change. They do it at the polls, and I guarantee that every other district attorney out there who thinks the same way, including all those other politicians, is paying attention to what happened. Now, it's going to require this happening over and over again to really impact things. 
there's going to be change in the rhetoric, but it's going to take voters to change those people out to get people that are law abiding in there. Californians now they're focusing on Los Angeles District Attorney George Gascon, a guy who many people publicly complain has lost sight of enforcing crime and protecting his community. To date, more than 500,000, a half a million votes have been obtained to recall Gascon. They only need 67,000 more to get rid of him. And what kind of things have the LA voters been upset about? Well, it's things like this recent news that broke about Charles Manson's follower, a woman who murdered actress Sharon Tate and four other people in 1969. Patricia Krenwinkel was convicted of seven counts of first-degree murder, according to local media channels. If you don't remember her, she fatally stabbed uh, LaBianca after uh, the cult leader Charles Manson told her to do something witchy. Then she used the victim's blood, uh, hers and others, to scrawl the words, death to the pigs, helter-skelter, and rise on the walls of the crime scene. So why am I talking about a 74-year-old woman who spent her life in a California prison? Well, after being denied parole 14 times, a new parole board has recommended that she be released from prison. They claim she's been a model prisoner, and more importantly, for the first time since she went to prison, nobody from the Los Angeles County Prosecutor's Office showed up to, to object to her parole request. That's because Los Angeles County District Attorney George Gascon banned his prosecutors from being involved in this, deciding whether or not inmates should be released back into the community. It didn't matter that family members of the victims were continuing to urge the board to keep Krenwinkel in prison, but nonetheless, it sounds like she might walk. In part, because the state didn't object to the release. Well, that's another reason why these recall votes are so important. I believe 500,000 voters who have already signed the petition are sending a clear message that they disagree with those policies. In fact, as Los Angeles County Sheriff Alex Villanova prepared to move on toward the fall elections, he shared his thoughts on Gascon by announcing Boudin had been recalled. And then he said, George Gascon, you're next. Let's watch this video. The DA of San Francisco just conceded he has been recalled. George Gascon, you're next. Well, please take a moment, folks, and enter your thoughts on this week's crime recap down below. I'm going to be watching for your comments, and thanks for supporting Profiling Evil. I hope that you'll take time to visit our website at profilingevil.com. You can register for our free newsletter, The Bolo. You can check out our story maps. It's a great site. And by the way, while you're at it, please hit that like and subscribe button and consider joining our channel memberships. My favorite, it's the Academy level, and I really think you'd like it. And folks, if any of you live in Los Angeles, please consider your position on this recall vote in the district attorney's office issue. It's the most powerful way that you can express your position. And frankly, it's our privilege as law-abiding citizens to cast our vote. Hey, we'll see you all soon at the next crime scene.